Good afternoon and welcome back. We hope you're enjoying day two so far. In this session, we have gathered an expert team to discuss how the changes in the culture of digital assets are affecting the industry. Please welcome our moderator, Tom Higgins, CEO of Goldeye and CryptoSwitch, to introduce our speakers. Let's give them a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed, and thank you all for coming, and thank you to my esteemed panelists for joining me here. Um, this is a, an area that's very close to my heart, and the crypto world is such an exciting place. Um, it's an amazing place to work in, and I liken it a little bit to, to Jurassic Park, but what I don't want to happen is it to end being eaten by the dinosaurs. So let's hope we can have a different movie in the franchise that doesn't end up being eaten by the dinosaurs, but gets all that excitement that you start at the beginning of the film and you can see those lovely dinosaurs coming out and running around and having such fun. So... We're going to look at how the crypto world has developed and what's happening in the future in payments, in trading, and in things like the metaverse. I think it's a very exciting space, and they're all joined up together and with the panelists before we talked about the metaverse. So um, our expert panelists here are going to guide you through this place to make sure you don't get eaten by a dinosaur. So we're going to start with some introductions. Um, we've got Mina, Fotis, Tejinda, Yanios, and Evgeny. They're each going to introduce themselves and their companies, and then we're going to go through some questions. At the end, I will be asking questions to the audience. So if you can think as we go through of some questions you'd like to ask, that would be great. And then they've roving mics so you can ask those questions. So if we could start here and do the introductions, Mina, if you could start. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mina Luca. I represent a group of companies called uh, B2 Broker. So in our company or a group of companies, we... Uh, we built like an ecosystem of uh, different branches of the ecosystem from brokerage, liquidity, technology, CRM, platforms, white label solutions for crypto exchanges, crypto payment processing, and digital banking. So kind of end-to-end -end client journey solution. Uh, and we've got few licenses in different parts of the world. Uh, in my remit, I am uh, the CEO of two of our companies in the UK. One is the digital banking, the EMI, and another one seeking the crypto registration in the UK. Hi all, thank you for being here with us. I'm Fotis from Capital Wallet. Capital Wallet is a crypto trading exchange and a payment processing platform uh, focused on both uh, B2B and retail side. We are trying to have as much products as we can. Uh, we just launched uh, the re totally revamped product and we are going to, uh, to further develop starting from uh, three quarter. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sinda Kumar. I work for uh, Sonda Global. I'm the global head of sales. To make everyone's life easier, you guys can just call me TJ, and I will give you a tongue twister if you're trying to pronounce my name. Uh, first of all, pleasure sharing the panel with all these uh, uh, the industry experts. Uh, it's great. About Zonda Global, so we actually rebranded from BitPay uh, last November, actually December. I'm sure if you guys probably heard the name before. Uh, we are a crypto uh, exchange uh, based in Poland, working under Estonian regulation at the moment. We are the biggest in Poland, one of the biggest in Europe. We are one of the first exchanges uh, in Europe who actually got Canadian uh, regulation license approved last February. So we're looking to be expanding in there as well. We're also venturing into uh, uh, PSP uh, sort of services uh, for some of our uh, big merchant clients. So making cryptos as a payment accessible for everyone. And yeah, that's Tonda for you. Thanks, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Janos Ashodis. I'm, uh, I'm a partner with Grant Thornton here in Cyprus. I'm leading the regulatory compliance uh, services. Um, so being involved in the regulated uh, services, providing uh, services to regulated entities for, uh, for more than a decade now. and really pleased to be here in this panel. Good afternoon. My name is Evgeny. I'm head of uh, B2B products at Celsius Network. Celsius Network is lending and borrowing platform in which our consumers, our community, deposit their money and we generate them yield. Based on these uh, assets that uh, our community put in, we generate yield, very high uh, returns, and a uh, few interesting facts. Uh, Celsius is the biggest Bitcoin holder in the world today, uh, holding more than 151,000 Bitcoins, and Celsius has a business named Celsius Mining, uh, which is going public very soon after C1 uh, filling documents. So in my work, I manage a group of product managers. 
uh, my group, we are working on credit cards, institutional internal tools, retail lending, uh, institutional lending, and many interesting things for our community. Thank you very much, everybody, for those introductions. Um, well, I think we cover a, a really broad range of the crypto market here. The first thing I want to get into is stable or not so stable coins. So how has the, this is open to everyone in the panel, how has the UST and Luna collapse affect the confidence in stable coins and what is going to happen in stable coins going forward so that they remain a usable entity? What happened with Luna and UST is very interesting, not only regarding stable coins, but it has impact on all over the crypto industry. So we saw, for example, in this cooldown period, which we saw the numbers dropping of uh, DeFi coins, etc., by around 90%. And all crypto is based on what's called community and trust. So we can look on it, and then I will touch specifically the stable coins, but the point of trust and everything about crypto can be resolved by strong community and code. But during the years, it was uh, involved something about taking high visible persons, entrepreneurs, and building the companies around them. And this is what happened in Luna. So they build an ecosystem, they issued a coin, UST, which is algorithmic stable coin. So to understand, there is like three types of stable coins. Algorithmic, backed by a real asset, and CBDC, which is central bank digital currencies. And what we saw uh, is kind of panic for example, the biggest stablecoin is Tether, USDT. We saw like $12 billion being returned to Tether and changed to fiat back because of the peg. The consequences of this uh, losing of trust in Luna is impact on the market very strongly. And we see it right now. And again, who's holding here the stablecoins like USDC or USDT or USDP, which is Paxos. So there is no reason for this panic and uh, the communities and the end users don't understand it because if you look at Tether, you can always return your stable coins and get back one US dollar for every token. If you are talking about the USDC, the circle, so you can always return it to circle as organization and get back, making an offer. And the panic created, it was like a few moments where you saw that even these popular big stable coins losing the pegging to US dollar. And why? Just because panic. Because one USDC equals one US dollar, which you can always return to circle and get uh, your dollar back. So I think that at the current days, the panic less reduced and the trust is coming back because who is interested in these coins? They are reading, they are understanding that this is stable. There is an organization big like Circle or Paxos which are regulated and we will see like step by step the trust come back. Thank you very much for that. I wonder if any of the other panelists have got any comments on whether this can happen again, whether we do need to still worry about other stable coins that exist today or other ones that are, may come along, that are in planning. Basically, Evgeny raised a, a very, very important point here. Uh, he talked about the whole ecosystem working on trust. So uh, what, what I would like to point out here is that exactly what happened was, was the reason why regulators have to have a say in what's happening. The reason of any regulator is, is based on two very, very important pillars integrity of the markets, protecting the integrity of the markets, and protecting the interests of the investors. What happened here happened exactly because there was no outside force to ensure that these two very important pillars of regulation would be applied. So I think that this is a very, very good showcase of exactly why regulation needs to be somehow 
affected into the whole ecosystem of, of cryptos. So, I mean, to answer, Tom, I think that regulation is one of the answers that need to be heard in, in, in regards to ensuring that something like this is, will have less of, of a possibility of happening again. I agree entirely on that one. And I, I, Tajinda, have you got a no, comment? No, um, Giannis and Yevgeny already explained it very well. And I personally feel it didn't affect any confidence in the stablecoin itself. UST is just one form of stablecoin. And like uh, Yevgeny mentioned, it's an algorithmic trading, uh, algorithm stablecoin, which actually isn't backed by anything. When you look at the other stablecoins, the USDT, the USDC, the BUSD, they're actually backed by fiat. And when USD was actually dropping, uh, the other stable coin, especially USDT, was actually going up. So I don't see from investors and retail client point of view that the confidence actually went down. It just, you always can trust on uh, uh, what we call it the blue chip, uh, the coins, obviously. And they're still number three and number four on the top ten from from market cap perspective. But yeah, like Janus mentioned, regulatory uh, regime definitely needs to be there to protect those retail clients who probably lost a lot of money uh, when the crash actually happened. I think if I look at, um, look at this point um, from a different perspective, you, you've got Luna, uh, Terra Luna, if uh, they, they got away with it, the biggest wealth management company, without mentioning names, still, still got away with it. So legally, legally, nothing happened illegal. They found a, they found a gap in algorithm. They used it in their own advantage, but that collapsed the market. So the, any regulations, any AML registration, because they call it AML registration, not really a full license, they look at compliance, they look at AML, they look at uh, uh, fraud prevention, they look at IT security, but they don't look at how the algorithmic are built, they don't look at f gaps, because it's a learning curve for everyone. So this will pay attention, uh, everyone, to these gaps. Well, let's move on to the topic of regulation then, because it seems key, because that seems to be a really important part in getting stable coins accepted. So how will regulators who are all over the world, they are not necessarily up to speed on cryptocurrencies as they are on traditional assets, how will they come together to produce something that is, will work globally? Because I don't think we're going to have a situation where we have a regulator in one place doing it in a completely different way to another one, because all the business will just move to where the easiest area is, as it was in FX. So how will that develop? Um, into a, a proper global regulatory regime? Right now, I mean, <laughs> regulation is, is, is almost non-existent. Uh, in the European Union, you, you have the so-called registration of crypto exchanges, which pretty much only covers uh, uh, currency, I mean, uh, fiat to crypto, crypto to crypto, and some uh, crypto to fiat exchanges, and also digital wallets, but nothing else pretty much covered in terms of uh, regulation. And, and even in the European Union, you have various types of regulatory approaches. I think all of this is going to start changing uh, probably in 2023 or late 24 when, uh, when MIGA is going to come into play, which is a market in crypto assets, which is pretty much the equivalent of the market in financial instruments that we had back in 2007. Uh, that's for when basically we had for the first time a unified financial services regulation coming about in the European Union. So I think that's going to be critical because for the very first time we will have, I'm not going to say global, but, but at least a generally accepted framework of regulation, which is going to start shaping how regulators should be approaching crypto as, as an asset, as, as a medium of payment, as a representation of property. Uh, because Mika, and if you haven't looked it up, I mean, the, the, the draft is already out there, and it gives all of these different examples of how cryptos can be can be regarded and, and treated. So I think that's going to be the first step. But from there on, I do not really expect that we're going to have a single way of approaching crypto assets from all jurisdictions globally. I mean, we've seen that, and, and I'll give the example of, uh, of the forex industry. Even after so many years, you see that even though there is a general consensus from most of the regulators and jurisdictions about how crypto should be regulated, you see that there's still some regulators which have a much, much more linear approach. So at the end of the day, regulation, I think, is going to be formalized and unified in a way, but it really remains to be seen how, how this regulatory approach is going to have global, uh, a global implementation, so to speak, and, and affecting 
all of the industries, all of the different types of coins that are going to be, that are going to be uh, coming out as part of the, of the Mika universe, as part of the crypto asset universe, the way that Mika is describing it. Thank you very much. Uh, before I answer this question, are there any regulators sitting in the audience I should be aware of? So we can sign some NDAs. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> Joke aside. They're all, uh, I they're all watching believe, the live streams, though, so... <laughs> uh, I personally believe, uh, in regards to the regulators, uh, and we all agree that regulation, the framework needs to be there. And at the moment, what we've also seen as well, uh, the regulators are taking a one-shoe-fit-all uh, one approach, which is not really right, because as we see, if they're trying to do the same framework, what we already have for banking or financial institutions, and they're trying to put digital assets or cryptos in there, that framework is already failing as it is. We've seen, for, so for 2020, there was 24 big banks, major financial institutions that got fined by local regulators. And in 2021, it went up to 84, resulting in $3.2 billion in fines. So just copy-pasting that same framework for digital assets, we're just setting ourselves up for fail. So we need to start from a, from a blank sheet of paper, get, exper get experts help, like the experts here, I'm not, but the guys here, uh, they've been in industry, they've got decades and decades of experience, get help from them and then develop something that is not killing innovation but actually protecting everyone. Because the human mindset, how it works, yes, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably a risky business. And it's easier to say no. But if you're going to say no, the client will just go overseas or offshore. And then they're still trading or using an unregulated exchange. So it's not really helping anyone. So we really need to sit down and make this framework work with the help from the people, from the industry. So. Thank you for that. Has anyone else got a comment? One fine line that people tend to mix, is it highly, should be highly regulated, or if you highly regulate it, that will be no different than the current banking system. So to make sure that we use crypto in the most efficient way, like a DeFi, use it for uh, uh, smart contracts, uh, insurance, uh, um, and depending on mortgage, et cetera, et cetera, to use it in a different DeFi way, decentralized finance, then we have to be very careful if it's highly regulated or decentralized. There are two, this is a fine line between both. Decentral decentralization is what we're looking for, but regulate all these activities to do it in the right way. That's what we're looking for. Thank you very much. That, that actually also leads into my next question very well, so thank you for that, which is all about exchanges. So. There's sort of two types of exchanges. There's centralized exchanges and there's decentralized exchanges. What does the panel think? Which exchanges are going to be the ones that will survive? Will it all go centralized? Will there be a mix of the two? Will there be a, some sort of merger? Or will decentralized just win everything? Um, who wants to answer that one? Anyone here? I, I will okay. start. Um, so let, I will start with an example. To our audience, which is centralized exchanges, the most popular are uh, Binance, Coinbase, Kraken. Now, the decentralized exchanges, you can find Uniswap, OneInch, Bancor, and uh, thousands of other protocols who've been uh, written and used. So, to this question about what is in the future, uh, both centralized and decentralized, they need to live in parallel. And here we're touching exactly the point of the regulation. So for the users who are going into crypto for the first time, they want to exchange their fiat into stablecoin to get some other asset or to gain yield like we are doing in Celsius, they must go through these centralized exchanges, which are easier and the fees are smaller. But the gap of this centralized exchanges. And by the way, the market is dominated by centralized exchanges. Something around 90% of the trading volumes going through these centralized exchanges. But in the decentralized, and the main motivation there is smaller fees. So it's only protocol and code which match in between the buyer and the seller or the pool. So there is, the commissions are much smaller. And if you're going through the beginner who started at Binance or Coinbase and purchased the first assets, then you move to the centralized, which where you can have more flexibility in trading and lower fees. But here we are touching again the point of the regulation. So how from the decentralized, you're taking money back 
your revenue into your uh, bank account and do with it uh, other investment in the fiat world. Thank you very much. So, Ginger, you up? did you have a comment? Yeah, I think uh, it will be a mix of both. It will depend on the, um, the clients who are using it. If it's a retail client who's probably a teacher uh, by profession, for them, uh, a centralized exchange is probably the best option because they probably don't even know what pancake swap is or how to even use that or what's a slippage, how to set slippage and all that. And if you're talking about someone who may be an experienced trader uh, or a hedge fund or an institution, for them, decentralized exchanges is probably the best, uh, they will serve them best as well. So I guess it will be a bit of mixture for, uh, uh, in both. It wouldn't be one better than the other, in my opinion. Thank you. If we go back to the beginning of crypto when somebody invented it somewhere that we don't know who they are, um, it wasn't really about punting around the price of Bitcoin going up and down and using all the energy in the world. It was a different sort of thing. So I want to look at how the growth of payments, actually using it as a money source, paying each for, for goods, um, will develop over the next 18 months because that is, it's, it's a parallel to trading, but it's a different thing. Um, what does the panel think about that? Well, th th that's actually tricky. Th that's really tricky because, and, and this is something that we see in practice, even though we see that you have a lot of EMIs, you have the, a lot of electronic money exchanges that are onboarding merchants that are accepting cryptos. In reality, these merchants are not really facilitating any kind of uh, selling of, of goods or services through cryptos. These merchants are effectively crypto exchanges or portals for crypto exchanges. So in practice, even though you're absolutely right, Tom, I mean, it started off as, as a clever idea of, of, of having this community of being able to, uh, to facilitate to go back to the basics of, of trade, basically, and use barter for trading, because that's what it's all about. We see that, unfortunately, it has been transformed in, into a pure speculative, speculative industry. So it's all about speculation. Uh, and I'm not really here to judge whether this is right or wrong, but I'm just saying that it hasn't really picked up as a medium of, of, of payment, as a means of payment for something. I know that there's some merchants that might be accepting it, but uh, the growth of, uh, of, of crypto assets as a medium of payment in comparison to the number of cryptos that have, were developed just for speculative or other reasons is, is totally dis disproportionate. So uh, it hasn't picked up. Okay, thank you. Fotis, what is your view on this? Yeah, uh, the payments uh, really uh, change a lot uh, in the upcoming years. Uh, we, have, uh, we are already seeing this, starting from online uh, services and going to real uh, e-commerce. The way of the payments that they are being doing uh, will be totally different. Uh, will be easier, faster, more secure for everyone, uh, providing access to even to people that have no bank account at all. Uh, and uh, totally different jurisdictions. And will they, what will they be using? What instrument? Will they be using Bitcoin or will they be using stable currencies or will they be using central bank digital currencies? My opinion is they will, they will be used, uh, first of all, stable currencies. But uh, again, it uh, depends on the jurisdiction and the, and the stability of the, of the payment system there. Uh, they, might be, they might be choose to, to use... Uh, for example, Lightning Network. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any comments on that? Well, it's like, it's interesting point uh, regarding how the communities uh, at the blockchain are looking on these crypto assets. So, for example, when you look on uh, Bitcoin in the beginning, uh, how it's described in the white paper as a payment method, it's not. It's impossible. It supports, I think, seven transactions per second. So it's impossible to use it as a payment. Now, when you look from the other angle, what is it gold? Uh, gold, sorry, uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is saying that it's gold. It keeps the value. And if you look at the Bitcoin, even now, in these days, it's maybe less popular because there are so many people who lose their investment, still, if you look since 2008, it's only growing and growing and growing. And at current crash or cool down, it's around 30,000. So it was like 300, 3,000, 30,000, 
etc. So the question is, do you want to exchange your Bitcoin? Do you want to give your Bitcoin to Elon and to replace it with Tesla? So Elon does want to take your Bitcoin because he knows that at some point he is a believer, yeah, a believer of uh, crypto. He believes that it will only go and on. So he wants to keep it. And now you, as the hodler of uh, Bitcoin, you need to ask yourself, should they give it or keep it, hodl and chain yield on it on uh, platforms that are uh, offering it. Thank you. I think the important point here is that we're saying that for payments, you want to have something that is probably worth the same today as it's going to be worth tomorrow or next week because the pound in your pocket or your euro wants to be pretty stable because you want to know what it's worth. Whereas with something like Bitcoin, it's still very, very early in the days of digital assets. And it's a little bit like when the first cars came out, they had to walk in front of them with a red flag because they thought it was too dangerous and you couldn't go more than four miles an hour. Well, it's all changed since then. So it's very early on. And the consensus seems to be that stable coins solve that problem because they don't go up and down. Bitcoin is, is still volatile and, and, and are not, a, not a completely stable thing enough at all to be able to use. So, so it's developing. But moving on from that, um, there's, an awful, there's always a lot of talk, and I want to explore this a bit more, about how digital assets can help those who are unbanked. Because there are millions of people in the world who can't get a bank account, who can't make payments very easily, and are called the unbanked. And how can this amazing technology, through whichever coin it is we end up using through, for payments, how can that help them? I can answer that. Simple answer. You don't need bank. You own crypto. You own your own money. Why do you need a bank? You want to save your money. Uh, you want to maybe borrow from your bank. You can do the same things with now with the blockchain. So in my eyes, like having a bank or having a no bank, it doesn't really matter. Blockchain is there to solve those issues. And as we see that technology is advancing in the coming years and in five to ten years, what blockchain will be or what cryptos or stable coins can do in the future, I, I honestly believe it will be a totally game changer. Well, ba basically, okay, okay. first let me just uh, analyze a, a little bit what you said. Most of the people that don't have access to banks uh, are usually people in, uh, you know, that, that live in poverty, that they don't have access to infrastructure. So, so basically these are not people that they would be willing to, to, to depend on, on, on crypto or, or any other currency, I mean, for, for their life savings or for the whatever little uh, income they might have or whatever social support they might be getting for the government. So I think that for crypto assets to be utilized as a, 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 a conduit of providing banking to, to, to this very, very large segment of the population, uh, especially in, uh, in Southeast Asia and uh, some, some parts of Africa, I think that there has to be governmental initiative. There has to be national initiatives which they're going to be digitalizing their own currency. Because again, you're not talking about sophisticated people. You're talking about people that don't really know about Ethereum and about, and about uh, blockchain and about distributed ledger technologies. So these are people that they wouldn't be trusting anything that they wouldn't be familiar with. So I think it's critical that you have government intervention here, that you have initiatives from governments to initiate uh, the, these projects of digitalizing perhaps as a first step their own currency and then giving access to the people uh, so that they can get them into the financial system. So it's not really about giving banking, it's about giving access to the financial system in general, I think, to, to, to this very, very large portion of, uh, of these populations. So I think it's, it's critical that you have government intervention there. Is it about more about the ease of access and the technology that gives you that ease of access rather than the fact that it's a cryptocurrency? Because if you have no banking, you have no way of sending money to anybody, and someone says, well, you can go into this bank, you can open an account, you can write a check, you can post it to someone, <coughs> or you can go on your app and you can click a button and it goes to them. They go, well, the app one's much easier. I'm, you know, it's straightforward, I can just do it. And it's a little bit like many parts of, say, in Africa, the telephone network didn't develop for everybody with wires because it was just far too difficult to put wires in everywhere. And so the predominant method of communication is via mobile networks because you can put one mast in and it goes for a very long distance to thousands and thousands of people. So is it the technology that's the thing that's doing it here rather than the fact that it's crypto? I would add 
to, to your point, 1.7 billion adult people around the globe doesn't have access to the banking system. Now, we can see in development countries, but this is not only. Even in the United States, in Israel, you have hundreds of thousands of people with no access to the banking system because of the bad credit score, bad history, their accounts have been blocked. And then there are day-to-day it's, you can see it like poor becoming poorer because they don't have access and they still need to do things like paying their utility bills because they need electricity. And this is a not fair game of banks creates more and more poverty. So the solution for it is definitely in crypto and blockchain as an access gate for this billions of people back to the banking system and creating for them, again, we're talking about countries where like two or three dollars commission, it's a lot of money. And definitely crypto is towards the direction. It will not be easy because then it's becoming the battle for the whole money in the world. And the banks are there. They're waiting, they're developing, and they don't stand still. So it will be very interesting to see how it's evolved in the uh, upcoming years. Well, to to add to my dear panelists, uh, but they all uh, mentioned valid points. The only point I would add to this, the lack of having the end-to-end journey of of a cryptocurrency. So yes, we may, of course, I agree. The question is, why do we need banks? Maybe now we need them, but these banks will have to evolve and as you can see, all the big players, they started to get into uh, the digital assets and cryptocurrency and they're, they're building their own units and, and technology. And they're already having the infrastructure and like JP Morgan, Citibank and, and all the big players, they're getting into the digital banking. So the question is, why do we need the banks? No, these banks, the ones that they would, wouldn't cope with the involvement of the crypto asset, they are the, they are the ones that would be out. But to add to this, the reason why we still need them, because the end-to-end journey is not there yet. We're not at this stage. It's a new thing. You pay to a merchant. The merchant needs to use this money because he needs to pay taxes, he needs to uh, pay, for, for, pay for his livings, and so on. So the, the entire circle has to be there before we decide which players will be out of the the whole circle. I remember once when I went into the city of London, I went in, I was visiting someone at a bank and I went into their reception and the entrance hall was absolutely enormous and it was all marble lined and they had two Formula One cars sitting in there and I thought, and this is where all the money goes that you make from me is and why should I have to actually pay for that? It doesn't seem right that you're using all this um, to make yourself richer. So I think it's very interesting um, comments you've had on all of that and how that, how that will help. One of the areas we want to look at is we're at an FX and the CFD conference and we're talking about crypto. So how can all of this merge into what the, our friends in the FX and CFD broker world works? How can they add cryptos, or digital assets to use the polite term, to their portfolios um, to, to in, encourage more trading, to get, more, to, to, to get a different um, set of customers using them who would not necessarily use them before? I think liquidity is the answer. Uh, having the right liquidity to, to absorb these high volumes of transaction would be the answer. And I think all the players are there now and uh, more investors getting into the liquidity business and uh, liquidity aggregation. And I think to, to make sure that these transactions are, uh, are fast, are, uh, no lapse, but, you know, uh, pricing are close to the accurate, then liquidity would be the answer. And will it require regulatory changes to allow these people? Because if you're a regulated broker and OFCA in London and you want to list a Bitcoin trading on your, uh, on your MT5 or so, for example, um, how can you do that if you're not, you haven't got regulation? When will that come? Well, that's a very big discussion. I mean, uh, there is, there's a couple of ways that this can be done. Now, initially... All the FX brokers were using CFDs on cryptos, right? Because they wanted to get into the game. 
Uh, and the only way to do this was to offer CFDs on, on, on cryptos, just like you would be offering CFDs on any other kind of asset class that has a relative amount of liquidity, so you have a pretty constant flow of prices coming in. Now, that has changed, however, and we've seen that exactly because of regulation, that where brokers are going now is the ultimate aim for brokers is to have one major interface through which they will be interacting with their clients, but through this interface, through this application, to have the ability to offer CFDs, so basically financial instrument trading, uh, crypto trading, uh, even offering uh, payment services through, through a single interface. So, so I, I don't think that we can really talk about integrating crypto trading into the brokers. It's about the brokers themselves finding a way to integrate multiple services, but while keeping the same interface with their clients. And I think this is where it's going, and this is what Revolut is trying to do, to, uh, to do right now. This is what we've seen other contenders in the market trying to do. So crypto is definitely here to stay when it comes to trading and when it comes to uh, being offered to, to retail clients. Uh, regulation is definitely going to help because it's going to give more comfort to the, to the retail users that since they're going to be trading with brokers that are regulated, uh, they, they, they will have some comfort in regards to investor protection. So I, I think it's a matter of the brokers finding a way to, to, to offer multiple services to their clients. So in this way, and since the big boys are going to be doing it, I think that offering cryptos is definitely an eventuality for, for everyone right now. Thank you very much. If, is there any more comments here? That would be great. Otherwise, we'll move on to questions from the audience. Has anyone got anything else they'd like to add? Okay, are there any questions in the audience that we have that you've prepared while we've been going? Uh, yeah, there's a question at the back there. Uh, thank you. Um, so I just had a question about um, like yield and um, what we've seen with like anchor protocol and people locking up uh, digital assets for a period of time. Does it, what, what happened with Luna show uh, a, a possible like, larger risk around lock in in, in your, uh, your digital assets for like yield farming? Just curious on like, panel's thoughts, uh, especially like, like Celsius. So in Celsius, we used uh, not Luna directly, we used their protocol, it's called Encore. They had uh, the Terra Labs, the organization which stands behind Luna. They had like one is Mirror for uh, trading stocks, synthetic stocks, and one is Encore. So we supported it and we worked with Encore. We had there around half billion dollars of assets in Encore, uh, something around a week before the, the whole crash, based on different uh, risk assessments that had been done in the company, all the community money were taken off. So what we're doing in Celsius and uh, what you mentioned is we're not doing staking. We are doing yield by uh, deployment the coins in different protocols and lending to institutionals, but we are not locking them. And it means that f from our approach, our community can withdraw the money whenever they want. It's not locked there like in staking. Has Thank answered you. your question. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I can't see any hands, no. So I'd just like to thank you all for coming and thank you for the panel for your insights. I think some of the key things I took out of this is that trust and community are really, really important in this. And we don't need to worry so much about the stable coins that are backed by fiat or will be backed by the central bank digital currencies. But we should be a bit nervous about something that's algorithmically backed. So that gives us some comfort. We can think about that. Regulation has come up a lot, and it's absolutely key to get all of the, the players involved and to have a, a, a safe environment that everybody can play in. And I think that that's what, what, what will then allow the banks to come in. And whether the banks will dominate and just buy everything because they've got all the money, we will wait and see. Centralized, decentralized is going to be a mix. So I think that's sort of not sure whether it's going to happen. Payments is very interesting as well. The fact that there seem to be a, a lot of views on that something that's volatile like Bitcoin, it has to, we have to have something more stable that's using for payments. But the technology behind Bitcoin that's then led to all of the other much more advanced blockchains um, is amazing. And the Bitcoin is the, is the car with the red flag. But the, the technology that's come out, 
with allowing things like decentralized exchanges will, will change the world. So thank you so much for your insights and do grab the panelists afterwards if you want to have more conversation with them. Thank you very much, everyone.